Hello, everyone. Welcome and uh, thank you for attending day two of our two-day pharmaceutical sterility assurance, contamination control, and extractables and leachables webinar series. My name is Katrin Salens, and I'll be your moderator today. This session, Changing Regulatory Requirements for Extractables and Leachables Testing on Pharmaceutical Packaging Systems, is aimed at providing you the opportunity to establish or update your ENL testing knowledge. Here to present is Anja Sterstjans, our Director of ENL Services at Nelson Labs Europe. Now, if you miss one of our webinars and would simply like to refer to one, you can always find them on the Nelson Labs or the Sterigenics website. We're hosting them together with our sister company, Sterigenics, and you will find them on the on-demand webinars page about a week from now. As for this event, uh, we welcome questions and you may submit your questions at any time. Anja will answer as many as possible during our last 10 minutes of this session. We do ask that if you have a product-specific question, you can write it down and uh, contact Anja or a member of our sales team about it after the webinar. Now, let me introduce Anja Serstjans. Anja leads the study director team managing the ENL projects within Nelson Labs Europe. She has a very strong background in analytical chemistry and she has been reaching out to customers globally for the past 15 years, helping them overcome challenges related to extractables and leachables testing. In the meantime, her team has expanded to 29 study directors, leveraging knowledge in the field, in the ever evolving field, I must say, of extractables and leachables and serving biopharmaceutical and pharmaceutical companies worldwide. Welcome, Anja. So um, I now hand over the microphone to you. Okay, let's see if the slides are advancing. Okay, that works fine. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Kathleen, for giving such a nice introduction. Today, I hope you will get some insight in both the design space of an ENL study, but we will also browse through the regulatory landscape and you will discover what pitfalls you have to watch out for during the design of an ENL study. Some of the misfortunes of our clients result from language that may be ambiguous in several regulatory documents or there's information that's not present uh, in the guidances, or simply some of the informations that you do find in the guidance document don't actually reflect the current position of the regulators. Before we go browsing through the regulatory landscape, it is important that you understand what is expected from packaging materials for drug products. And where does the concern come from? Because after all, we are exposed in our daily lives to plastics and rubbers that are present everywhere. Our food is packed in plastic. So you may ask yourself the question, why such a big deal? Why it's such a great concern for packing medicines? After looking at some of the guidelines and documents, we will zoom into the general flow of an ENL study. And this is to help you understand during the last part of the presentation, some of the critical aspects of an ENL study from the view of the regulators. We will use language drawn from actual feedback of the FDA on data submission. So what is expected from packaging materials for drug products? In fact, pharmaceutical packaging components are the first line of defense to ensure the quality of the drug product. There are four pillars that contribute to the assurance of the quality of a product. A quick word on these four pillars. 
Uh, these are derived from the old uh, 1999 FDA guidance for industry. This is a rather older uh, guidance document and it uh, things are inside this document that actually don't reflect the current thinking of the regulators, but the guidance document is still useful as a general basis to look at suitability of container closure systems from a wider uh, perspective. First of all, any given container closure system uh, is there to protect the drug product from ingress of any type of contaminant. This can be um, uh, microbes, uh, environmental chemicals, um, it also is supposed to protect the drug from solvent evaporation, from light and so on. A packaging system is designed to ensure both chemical and microbial stability of the product. However, the use of plastic and rubber materials in the packaging systems brings along the risk of drug contamination. Plastics and rubbers are not at all inert materials and they may potentially release a myriad of chemical impurities into the drug, the drug that actually they're supposed to protect. Something went wrong with the... I don't know what happened. Sorry. I don't know, we're, we're scrolling back to the beginning of the presentation slide deck. I think uh, I must have accidentally hit the end button instead of the page down button. I'm so sorry. Okay, so where were we? Excuse me once more. So we were looking at uh, an example. Here's a pre-filled syringe. Um, Using a pre-filled syringe at a container closure system, there's a lot of different materials of construction with different uh, properties that come into play. Uh, the glass barrel can be uh, the barrel can be uh, composed of glass, clear glass or amber glass, but it could also be composed of uh, plastic like polypropylene, COP, COC, uh, and so on and so forth. And then there's the rubber plunger and the rubber tip cap. Uh, important is when the syringe is composed of semi-permeable material like COP and COC, there will be a requirement also for the investigation of secondary packaging. A label uh, affixed to the barrel of a syringe can release impurities that migrate into through the barrel into the contact solution. So that is important. Okay. <laughs> have to pay attention. So the, the second pillar is uh, compatibility. What do we mean? Uh, the drug uh, and the container closure system should be mutually compatible. This meaning that drug product and container closure system should not change. The quality of the product cannot be compromised. So uh, interactions like adsorption of absorption of the API or excipients are something to watch out for degradation of an API, a shift in pH, a change in color, whether it's the drug product or the packaging, these are all interactions to watch out for. And uh, these effects can be quite unpredictable, especially for biologics, proteins, where the secondary or tertiary structure of a protein might be affected or uh, aggregation can take place or particulate form uh, formation. Also, a container closure system should guarantee the performance and functionality and also guarantee the delivery of the right dose of the drug. In fact, quite a lot of container closure systems are in fact combination products. They are both a storage container and an administration device at the same time. In this way, any subcomponent of a container closure system, whether it contacts the drug formulation 
or it contacts the patient, all of these subcomponents are critical from an ENL perspective. The, let me go. the last pillar, of course, is quite obvious. A container closure system should not introduce any toxic compounds into the drug product. In other words, is there anything migrating from the different packaging materials into the drugs? And what are the levels that a patient might be exposed to? And if there is exposure, are these uh, migrants present at toxicologically relevant levels? And that's where extractables and leachable studies come into the picture. It's also clear that these four pillars cannot be viewed independently to decide whether a packaging is suitable or not. Uh, in fact, uh, for all these four pillars, ENL investigations are one of the cornerstones in this uh, decision making process. However, I need to add that the impact of safety and quality in terms of ENL is not limited to the container closure system. Also, manufacturing equipment related leachables are important to investigate, although uh, this is not in the scope of today's presentation. So here is a, a slide a little bit uh, summarizing what I've said uh, so far. Everything is about the safety of the patient, of course. Uh, and the rest of the presentation will be more about the strategy behind designing extractables and leachable studies and the current thinking of regulators. Technical aspects of ENL are also not in the scope for today, but as Catherine already mentioned, uh, I'm an analytical chemist, so I will be more than happy to answer questions on technical issues uh, later on. Here's a little animation that we made. Uh, it is important because I hope this will be uh, illustrating a little bit the difference between extractables and leachables. Uh, what you see here on the right hand side is in fact a, uh, an example of a drug in a blow field seal container. Uh, and the left hand side, uh, a little bit zoomed, you get a, a, a cross section of the wall of the container. Uh, the light blue part is the contact solution. The gray part is the, the polymer wall, the, the polypropylene of, of the vial, um, with a label in, in a little bit darker blue affixed uh, to the wall of the container. And all the uh, little uh, circles, squares, and triangles are representative for extractable compounds that are present inside the polymer matrix. So here we see certain uh, chemical compounds migrating into the drug solution. Very important. Uh, not all of the extractables, so extractables are the compounds that can be um, extracted from any type of material under aggressive conditions. The leachables are the ones that actually uh, turn up inside the, the solution under normal use conditions. So not every extractable uh, will become a leachable. And ultimately, of course, uh, in order to um, investigate uh, the product for safety, uh, it's most important that uh, we look at the leachable because the leachables are the compounds that end up in the patient, not the extractables. And then there's the next important question. Uh, do we really need to be worried? Uh, when I started 15 years ago, uh, first thing, it was, a, it was a playground for analytical chemists uh, doing all this chromatography and mass spectrometry. So, so I had fun doing my job. But I was always thinking, why, should, why, why is there such a big fuss? Because our food is also packed in the same type of materials. How uh, could there be a, a risk associated with, with packaging for medicines? 
it was something that I figured out uh, quite soon, but I must say in, in the beginning it puzzled me a little bit. What you also see that uh, I work uh, in, the, in the field for 15 years and uh, what I noticed is a, a strongly increased concern if you speak with regulators and also the scrutiny uh, they use for looking at data is, is, is a whole different world compared to 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so let's take a look at just a few examples and maybe a short trip down memory lane um, to look at some of these concerns. I think uh, you've all heard of bisphenol A and DEHB. Uh, both are um, endocrine disruptors, so these molecules can mimic the female uh, hormone, estrogen, and of course uh, exposure to, to little boys uh, can be quite um, uh, toxic, not good, uh, of course. Um, DHP has been banned for a while now uh, in, in uh, children's uh, toys and also, uh, luckily, uh, bisphenol A is no longer present in our uh, baby bottles uh, that we use uh, for the babies. It used to be like that, but not anymore uh, because of the same harmful effects, of course, uh, as BPA is also an endocrine disruptor. There are also a number of cases where uh, medicines were withdrawn from the market uh, due to uh, lack of good barrier properties of the primary packaging material. And here's just a, a few examples. And then going to the next slide, I think um, the message here is that it's quite easy to grasp uh, the understanding that the degree of concern is strongly associated with the route of administration. So if you have an oral uh, drug product, uh, you can compare a little bit uh, what happens uh, with food. Uh, if, if, it's oral, is the, if the intake is oral, uh, our intestines are quite a good barrier for ingress of, of strange chemical substances, meaning that not everything will be absorbed through the guts. And even if it's absorbed, there's the liver with the first pass metabolism. So the liver will detox uh, many chemicals and, uh, and hence reduce the bioavailability of, of things that, that come into your body. Now, you can understand very clearly that these protective mechanisms are short-circuited when a drug is injected or inhaled. Now, the most famous case here uh, is I think, um, I don't know because I was not there, but I think it was the case that triggered uh, all the regulatory uh, authorities to be more, um, to raise the concern on uh, extractables and leachables. So there was a product, uh, it's, it's called Aprex. It is a medicine that is used to treat anemia in patients that suffer from uh, chronic kidney failure. So it was a product that was in a pre-filled syringe, uh, as I uh, illustrated before, a pre-filled syringe has multiple sources of leachables, not only the rubber stopper, you have the barrel, the steak needle, uh, the glue that is used uh, for the needle and so on and so forth. So if we go back to 1998, uh, we saw that this product was on the market and there was a certain type of uh, very adverse effect uh, sometimes uh, occurring when using the drug. It is called pure red cell uh, aplasia. I don't know exactly uh, uh, not much information on, on this uh, adverse effect, but the occurrence was very, very low for this product. Then what happened, uh, in, and, and some of you may remember, there was uh, an increased attention for transmission of Kreuzfeld-Jakob back in the 90s, in the late 90s. 
So people said, well, uh, we don't want uh, uh, products containing human serum albumin anymore because the protein, the drug, the erythropoietin was stabilized with human serum albumin. So human serum albumin as a stabilizer was replaced by uh, the combo polysorbate and glycine. What happened is that all of a sudden there was a strong increase of incidence of PRCA. That was very uh, uh, detrimental and triggered, of course, uh, a, 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 an in-depth investigation. Now, what happened at the same time, uh, what the scientists observe, observed was an increased level of leachables. Then this increased le level of leachables, it was hypothesized that it had something to do uh, with the adverse effect. At that point, the yeah, hypothesis was that the, the higher number of leachables and higher concentrations could have triggered a kind of uh, adjuvant properties and react with the protein, triggered an immunological response and therefore uh, anti uh, EPO antibodies were produced. Um, so the increased incidence of the PRCA was in fact um, associated or correlated with the increased level of leachables, although uh, it was not a proof, so the, the proof was all uh, circumstantial. But then what happened? The rubber stopper, the original rubber stopper, which was uncoated, was replaced by a coated rubber. The coated rubber released much, much less leachables and all of a sudden uh, the incidence of the PRCA dropped to their original level. So indeed, uh, these few examples, just to illustrate that there is a, a real concern and the concern, I would say, is highest for protein drug products because of the, the immunological uh, responses that we have to be, uh, the immunogenicity uh, that could happen um, when leachables start reacting with uh, the proteins. And regulators are well aware of, of this effect. So with all this increasing knowledge and understanding, uh, on how impurities from, from a container closure system may impact the safety and quality of a drug product, of course there was a need for regulation and guidance. So if, if we browse through the guidances for ENL, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we see that there are actually two types of documents. Uh, you have on the one hand side uh, guidances and guidelines that will tell you what you have to do. But more useful, I would say, is uh, the ones that are more descriptive in nature. So the pharmacopoeias, the standard organizations, recommendation workgroups, consortia, they provide uh, quite comprehensive information that will help you uh, to set up uh, the ENL study in a way that authorities uh, expect it uh, for you to do. If we look here, really the first useful document uh, was the 1991 document from FDA, the FDA Guidance for Industry, Container Closure System for Packaging, Human Drugs and Biologics. Uh, although this, this document from 1999 will just tell you uh, what you have to do, uh, nowadays uh, FDA will ask you uh, to refer and design your study as described in USP 1663 and USP 1664. That is very important and uh, FDA uh, Although the USP 1663 and 1664 are descriptive documents, uh, they will still ask you to design your study according to these um, standards. 
Now, what is important, and I want to draw your attention to a certain table that was uh, in the FDA guidance document from 1999, and this table was adopted also in the USP 1664. But what happened is that uh, some of the categories of drug products moved one level down in risk. Of course, this if, if you would take it literally, it might lead to the wrong conclusion. And let's zoom into some of these lateral moves on this diagram. On the right hand side, for example, we see uh, the products with a low risk associated to the likelihood of interaction. In this category, you may find the LIO products. But in fact, they are not low risk uh, because of the outgassing effect. What happens is that uh, a rubber stopper, uh, even though it doesn't make contact with the lyo cake, will release volatile and semi-volatile compounds. Those compounds will absorb onto the lyo cake and kind of get concentrated onto the lyo cake. In our laboratory, in fact, uh, we see quite often that lyo products uh, will have more leachables than liquid formulations in the vial with a rubber stopper. This is feels like counterintuitive, but uh, it is really the case that lyo cakes are extremely um, delicate in terms of extractables and leachables. Also, the shift from injections and inject injectable uh, suspensions from high to medium risk uh, is a little bit tricky. You have to watch out uh, for this because the observation is mostly based on the fact that most parental drug products are aqueous based. For non-aqueous based drug products, of course, much more caution is needed. And then also uh, very important, uh, in the left bottom corner, you find the topical products. Uh, in our lab, we do see a strong increase in applications where regulators start asking also for ENL assessment for this type of product, especially if an alcohol is an ingredient of your formulation. And then finally, the oral products, uh, you, they are indeed much lower. Uh, there's a much lower concern associated to oral medicines, but also I want you to be aware that uh, ENL data are not necess necessary for oral products, except if they're for small children or children in general then again, the regulators uh, might ask you to submit uh, ENL data uh, for this type of product as well. Another pitfall to watch out for, looking at some of the existing guiding documents, what we see is that certain contact does not actually reflect the uh, position of the regulators. In both the FDA guidance document as well as in its European counterpart, attention is drawn to secondary packaging. The language inside the documents uh, refers to labels uh, inked and adhesives. In fact, uh, this is uh, why many of our clients think that only the inked and the adhesives are in the scope of testing when it comes to secondary packaging. Again, this is a wrong conclusion. And to illustrate this, I have uh, a case study here. Uh, it is a leachable study on a uh, uh, flexible multilayer bag containing a drug solution aged at two different temperatures for three months. And what you see here on the chromatogram is uh, the results for semi-volatile organic compounds. So if you look at uh, together with me at the upper chromatogram, it was a sample aged at uh, 40 degrees Celsius for three months. Uh, we see the largest um, peak is uh, indicated here with the arrow and, and, and in red is a bislactone. So uh, if we looked at the source of this leachable, we find, found out that it, is, it was not associated with the primary packaging, but it was coming from the overwrap. 
uh, that was around the multi-layer bag. So you have to realize that uh, volatiles and semi-volatile compounds are ve can very easily uh, travel by air, um, migrate through the primary packaging and end up in the drug solution. In fact, here uh, in this case, the highest concentration of leachable was actually coming from the secondary packaging. So if you read again uh, the language uh, inside the guidance document, be aware that it's not only about adhesives and inks, it's labels, it's pouches, it's overwraps. It is very important because also this type of um, secondary packaging can be a, a substantial source of leachables. Um, so, in fact, here were a few examples uh, to illustrate that the official guidance documents do not reflect the current position of the FDA and it's safer uh, and demanded uh, by the FDA to refer to the USP 1663 and 1664. Now, uh, for the second part of the presentation, I will walk you through the, the flow of an ENL study. Uh, it, is, it is very important uh, just to be able to understand the last portion of this presentation, where we will look at some actual feedback of the FDA. If we talk about an ENL study uh, for a drug product, what do we mean exactly? In fact, it is a sequential de-risking in four different steps. At each step, an important question needs to be answered. The first question is, what are the chemical impurities of the packaging? Here's where ex an extractable study gives the answer and the focus is on identification. The second question is, are there any bad actors in this potentially long list of extractables? What are the targets of concern? In the next phase, uh, uh, the answer that needs to be, uh, the question that needs to be answered is, which compounds are actually migrating into the drug product? These are the leachable studies and the focus shifts from identification to quantification at this phase. And then last but not least, to answer the question, is there a real risk for the patient? That's where the toxicologist comes in. So from this overview, you can immediately see that in order to qualify your packaging system, in the sequential de-risking steps, all the steps are equally important. And at each step, the number of involved chemicals decreases. Since it's, it is a procedure with four steps, another important message here might be start early enough with your ENL program. What I also want you to understand uh, during the next uh, few slides is that ultimately the leachables are the ones that end up in the patient. So um, at the end of the presentation, you might uh, be able to answer the question, why performing extract an extractable study as you are only interested in leachables? So um, let's jump to the next slide. Uh, again, um, working towards the definition, uh, or I, I will repeat myself, extractables are uh, chemicals that can potentially come out of the material and uh, this under extreme conditions. That is very important to, to know the difference between an extractable and a leachable. Uh, when I said earlier on that you have to start early with your ENL process, it's also important to not start too early. What, what, what do I mean by that? It is that packaging components should be used in their final form. So uh, the form, uh, the product will be more, goes to the market. So uh, everything needs to be fixed. If there's sterilization, washing steps, siliconization, labels, and so on, everything has to be determined and fixed before you start doing the testing. Otherwise, the results are simply not relevant. 
and here is an example, in fact, to, to uh, draw your attention that uh, you have to consider sterilization and get your sterilization uh, needs to be fixed and, and you cannot change it anymore. What we see in this case study is polypropylene containers before and after sterilization. I think it was e-beam in this case, if, if I remember correctly. So the material uh, before and after sterilization was extracted with dichloromethane. And um, you see here on, on top is the chromatogram of the sterilized uh, material and inverted is the unsterilized material. Um, the analysis presented here is uh, LCMS uh, acquired in EPCI negative mode. You see on the top trace uh, there are uh, much more uh, compounds present. And if we look at the next slide, uh, there's a little bit a zoomed chromatogram, so, so uh, you can see exactly what, what those peaks are. We identified all of these peaks uh, and they turned out to be degradation products of the polymer additive in the polypropylene Ergonox 1330. Uh, you see that uh, there's loss of uh, butyl groups at several sites of the molecule, you have oxidation, you have kinon formation and so on. So this is the effect of sterilization on um, the container closure system. So it is substantial. Okay, um, so uh, the first phase in extractable study is of course generating the extract from the components in its final form. And uh, you have to use exaggerated conditions just to approximate a worst case situation. There are three parameters that you can use uh, to, to work towards a worst case approximation of the drug product container closure system interaction. Of course, a choice of solvent. Uh, theoretically, uh, the drug product vehicle would be the best uh, uh, choice of solvent, but in practice, uh, it is not. Quite often is it, it is not because the ingredients of the drug product, whether it's the active ingredient or an excipient, uh, it causes simply too much analytical interference to allow for a good identification of all, all the extractables. So quite often uh, one needs to use uh, simulating uh, pure solvents instead of the drug product vehicle. Of course, temperature and time are important and also the material, material to solvent ratio that you will use. Once you have an extract, the next phase is analyzing the extract. Here you need to uh, use multiple analytical techniques which are more or less complementary to each other. Uh, such an orthogonal screening approach uh, minimizes the risk of not uh, seeing everything. You, you want to try to see everything. You can compare a screening approach a little bit uh, to fishing with a net. And um, the maze of the net is, of course, um, also important because it will determine whether you catch only the big fishes or also the small species. Translated to the analytics, the maze of the net would correspond to the analytical evaluation threshold. So how low will you go in concentration in the extract to go look for chemicals and identifying them? Okay, uh, once you have the list of um, extractables, and this can be a pretty long list, uh, it would take take up a huge amount of time and effort and budget to do a full tox assessment after uh, generating extractable data. Usually this is not done. What is done is an in silico evaluation of the data that is performed instead. Using appropriate QSAR software that relates functional groups to toxicological endpoints will allow you to categorize all the extractables that you have found um, and specifically of course uh, the ones that are important are the uh, carcinogens or, or the, the mutagenic compound but all, also sensitizer and irritants uh, are important and then you have uh, the compounds with the more general uh, toxicity uh, profiles. 
uh, important is that each class uh, has a specific threshold, a safety concern threshold. And the conclusion uh, would be that every extractable that is present in a concentration exceeding its specific safety concern threshold is a target compound that should be monitored uh, during a legible study. So at this point, you know which compounds need to be monitored in a drug product. And indeed, the subject of testing is no longer the, the materials, but it is the drug itself. And you will uh, investigate the drug uh, under normal uh, conditions instead of exaggerated conditions. Since you already know what you're looking for at this point, one will usually resort to more targeted methods, uh, which can be more quantitative in nature also. Uh, since you uh, know what you're looking for, you could be running a calibration curve for these compounds or even use validated methods just to be able to have uh, to discover more accurate concentrations of the leachables inside your uh, drug product. What uh, is also uh, done in, in a, um, a number of, for a number of drug products is uh, screening alongside your targeted uh, methods, uh, if this is possible. Uh, because, it, uh, as I told you before, the drug composition is not always compatible with the mass spectrometric techniques. Uh, but if they are compatible, uh, it is advisable to also use screening methods just to be able to detect also unexpected leachables. In an ideal world, the leachables are a subset of the extractables, but it's not always the case. Then during the last step, finally, a toxicologist will do the toxicological risk assessment of the leachables found in the product. So this sounds all pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, so, but where can it go wrong? What are the, the specific pitfalls that you have to watch out for? I will guide you through some critical aspects based on actual feedback from regulators on real cases of submission. So every time you will see uh, some language between quotes, this is actual language from the FDA answers to submissions. So maybe I will just uh, read them out for, for your understanding to make sure I don't go too fast. The conditions of the extractables assessment should attempt to mimic as closely as possible worst case in use conditions of the drug product. Justification for the selection of solvent solution should be provided, including, including but not necessarily limited to salt concentration, pH, temperature, agitation, duration of extraction, and so on and so forth. So this comment of the FDA was not about the design of the extractable study being not well designed or something. It is merely about uh, the, the sponsor not providing the justification for the whole setup of the study. So it is very, very important uh, if you don't just submit the extractable and the leachable data, uh, this will not be accepted. You have to clearly explain what you have done and what, what you don't, what you didn't do explain how the extractable study is uh, informed by the packaging and drug composition, how did you select your solvents, explain how your extractable results are leveraged into the leachable design, explain how your analytical evaluation threshold is calculated, use the correct safety concern threshold, explain how the toxicological assessment is performed, um, talk about the safety factors, the safety margins, the PDE calculations, and if possible, discuss uh, all of this uh, strategy with your regulatory authorities up front. Here's, an, here's another piece of language from regulators where they didn't agree on the analytical evaluation threshold.
In fact, uh, there are three golden rules. First, you have to convert a safety concern threshold for patient exposure expressed in micrograms per day to micrograms per liter in the extract of sample. Secondly, make sure you start from the correct safety concern threshold. Here in this example on the slide, it is 1.5 micrograms per day, but uh, for an inhalation product, for example, you should take 0.15 micrograms per day. You could also use the staged approach of the ICHM7 and um, um, take higher levels of, of exposure but never go higher than five micrograms per day. This, this would be my advice because um, there's always a possibility that some of your extractables or leachables may be irritants of our sensitizers. This is very important. And then last but not least, account for analytical uncertainty when using screening methods. By using an uncertainty factor, this will result in an additional safety margin this uncertainty factor, and that is very important, should be rationalized by your analytical lab. And it depends, of course, on the analytics and the methods that you are using. Here in this example, it is two, but it might as well be four or ten. And then ensure that the sensitivity of the methods is attuned to the appropriate safety concern threshold. I can guarantee it to you, a wrong AT is a very unforgiving mistake. Make sure uh, that you select the right safety concern uh, threshold uh, up front. Don't make the mistake uh, because inside the calculation, you will of course use uh, the daily dose that is uh, presented to the patient. Always use the maximum daily dose, not the prescribed daily dose. That is very important. And this is what went wrong in this particular uh, case. But even though if you started to do your ENL program and all of a sudden you realize that the dose uh, will be higher, go back to your lab if you made a mistake and ask them to revisit the data and go lower if possible. So here's another uh, one. Regarding your leachables data, provide overlaid chromatograms of the extracts and blank. This is a, at first glance a little bit a strange comment. I'll try to explain. The reason for the necessity of such a blank is that the screening analysis is always a differential analysis. So what is a good blank? It's certainly not uh, a placebo. This is what, what some of our clients uh, think, that uh, they will provide us a, a blank and then it's a placebo. No, that's, that's all wrong. For an appropriate, uh, an appropriate blank for a leachable study is in fact the formulation itself, but stored in an inert glass bottle with a Teflon-lined screw cap. At dif different checkpoints during the leachable study, a sample of the blank will be analyzed together with the sample of the actual product. And then with the right software, differential signals will be filtered out and reported as leachables. So ideally, your blank glass bottle formulation is aged together with the drug product samples. If not, let's say one one has no other possibility than to use a freshly prepared blank. This is often the case, for example, for uh, Lyo products, for example. Uh, there's a considerable risk associated with this um, because uh, during the differential analysis, one would risk picking up degradation products of the ingredients of the formulation as differential peaks. And in this case, the differential peaks can no longer be exclusively attributed to the packaging. And this is uh, indeed a problem, uh, and yet another problem with Lyo products. Here's another example of actual feedback of the FDA. Provide leachables analysis of multiple time points during shelf life of your product. FDA actually claims to expect data on three different batches of container closure systems. 
but if this is not possible, three batches of drug product are uh, accepted as well. FDA also wants you to provide adequate data to allow for trends analysis and a robust understanding of the leachable profile. Therefore, it is required to include multiple time points to check for leachables and not just uh, end-of-shelf life results. On this uh, little graph on the right-hand side, uh, it's um, the, the trends analysis for, for two leachables. You can see that the highest concentration is not always at the end of the shelf life. Uh, this is because uh, also leachables can degrade, resorb or um, disappear by the outgassing effect. And then I think this is my last slide already. Um, you know, leachable studies are mostly uh, conducted in parallel with the stability study. Let's say that you ha have a, um, a shelf life of 24 months. My advice again would be uh, plan ahead and start with your extractable study uh, at least one year in advance uh, to where your um, stability batches will be produced. Okay, thank you. Uh, how did I do for time? So, uh, Anja, thank you so much uh, for sharing your knowledge uh, today with all of us. Uh, Timing-wise, we're good. Uh, the good news is we still have time, a little bit of time left for a few questions. Um, so, now, in any case, don't worry if we don't get to your specific questions. Um, that means that Anya uh, will get back to those individually. But um, here I go, Anya. Um, what are the considerations for choosing between a safety threshold of 1.5 micrograms per day and 5 micrograms per day? Yeah, I, I think I, I addressed this already during my presentation, but I, I will uh, try to explain uh, a little bit more. You know, some people uh, would like to uh, often uh, resort to what is in the ICHM7, the staged approach for uh, mutagenic uh, species, and use this um, staged approach to um, increase the safety concern threshold for their product. Well, there is uh, certainly for injectable products, uh, you have to be aware that uh, the ICH M7 is really for a mutagenic uh, uh, species and uh, doesn't really consider um, uh, irritants and sensitizers. So the, the limit for irritants and sensitizers is uh, the exposure limit is five micrograms per day. So um, this is my advice, never uh, go higher than five micrograms per day. Okay. Uh, yeah, very helpful. Thank you, Anya. Um, instead of 24 months normal conditions for submissions of leachable data? Um, well, that's actually a good question. It, it is a question that, that we often get because, of course, uh, let's say that accelerated aging conditions uh, would be accepted by the authorities, then you could uh, submit everything. Uh, using the accelerated condition uh, checkpoint at six months, for example, and submit this uh, to the authorities and uh, presuming that this would be a worst case situation in terms of leachables. And uh, however, um, it is often like that, that uh, the accelerated aging condition at, at, uh, after six months is worst case compared to your end of shelf life under normal conditions but it's also a um, very simple answer actually authorities don't accept this because there are exceptions and it's not always that the six months accelerated aging condition uh, would be worst case compared to your uh, to, uh, end of shelf life normal condition uh, sampling point and, and um, results. So the answer is um, 
maybe uh, scientifically uh, in certain cases it would be enough but it's simply not uh, accepted by the authorities they always want to see the end of shelf life um, data points uh, and then maybe another piece of advice would be um, to really uh, don't try to um, do cost savings during your leachable study because let's your stability study is running along with your leachable study and what if uh, for one reason or another uh, you see that you have to uh, limit your shelf life to 18 months instead of 24 months for example because of of loss of stability or whatever quality issue that that you might uh, may find after 24 months then you don't have data so that is a, a real risk and it happens uh, it happens that clients they say okay we will just do a six months checkpoint and a 24 months checkpoint and then there's a problem after 24 months and then they don't have a an end of shelf life uh, data point anymore and they have to do uh, a redo of the leachable study and then it is uh, much more of a loss than um, being economical about uh, the choosing your data points for your leachable study Oh, Anya, um, the more you explain, I, I see the more questions comes in, come in. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have time to address all of them, but we will get back to those. One more before we close. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain what would be an appropriate blank for a pressurized metered, metered dose inhaler during leachables testing? Yeah. A PMDI. That's easier <laughs> to pronounce. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a good question actually because uh, try to uh, put the formulation of a pressurized meter dose inhaler into a glass bottle with a screw cap. Uh, understandably, this is not possible. Uh, what you then would do is you put you still put the bulk solution of the formulation in the glass bottle, of course, omitting the propellant. So this is what you should do, uh, taking the, the, the complete formulation and just omit uh, the propellant uh, from the solution. And that uh, will make a good bulk solution and a blank for your leachable study on your pressurized meter dose inhaler. Very clear. Thank you, Anja. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending our, um, our webinar series. Um, thank you, Anja, for explaining and sharing your, your knowledge uh, with all of us. As a reminder, uh, you can access all previous webinars on nelsonlabs.com or sterigenics.com under the Education tab. Um, we will make sure that the recordings of this webinar series um, are available uh, within a week from now. Our second session for today will go live in about half an hour from now. So that will be at 7 p.m. Central European time. If you haven't yet signed up for this session, no problem. You can still do that right now on our website. This session will address bacterial endotoxin testing. And there's one more thing. In May 2021, Nelson Labs, together with sister company Sterigenics, we will be hosting a live three-day pharmaceutical seminar. So that will also address uh, ex many extractables and leachables topics uh, more in depth during a complete day. More information about this uh, seminar uh, will be available on the both websites, nelsonlabs.com, sterigenics.com, or you can simply follow us on our social channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Any additional questions for Anya, please uh, don't hesitate to contact her. Um, if you need pricing information, including a quote, please contact our sales department. They will be happy to, uh, to help you. That can be either via sales at nelsonlabs.com or info europe at nelsonlabs.com. And if you have a, test, a question around sterilization, don't hesitate to send an email to info at sterigenics.com. Thank you once again. We hope to see you next time and uh, have a great day or evening. Okay.